papers entitled Commodore James Barron and Innovation in Early U.S. Navy. Our second is going to actually be the development by Samuel, Samuel Limios. 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 Limio. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. Uh, <laughs> my apologies. Who's at the uh, archives here at the Naval Academy? That's okay. And then our last paper today, oh, his paper, I'm sorry, is entitled Development of the United States Naval Academy's Unwritten Honor Concept from 1865 to 1875. And then our last paper today is going to be a virtual presentation by Edgar Antonio de Jesus Gallegos Ruiz. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's, it's correct. <laughs> it's a long, long name. I was planning to be in Sevilla next week, but then okay. everything just We could have perhaps uh, <laughs> His presentation is entitled The Birth of Mexico's Naval Power in 1821, a historical study in honor of its bicentennial. Okay, so today our first paper is going to be offered by Mike Romero. He's worked as a historical interpreter at Colonial Williamsburg in Virginia since May 2011. For the past six years, he's been conducting independent research into 18th century naval history, the age of sail, which is a good thing. Uh, and he's worked to bring the naval side of the American Revolution to life. The past three years has seen Mr. Romero earn certification in celestial navigation by the American Sailing Association. <laughs> complete a master's degree in U.S. military history concentrating in the American Revolution from the American Public University System. He's also published over a dozen articles through Colonial Williamsburg, the National Association for Interpretation, and the U.S. Naval Institute. And as he works to further develop as a naval historian, we all continue to work at, to further our development as a naval historian, uh, Mr. Romero has plans to complete a full-scale biography of Commodore James Barron, building on his recently completed thesis. Today, his presentation is entitled Commodore James Barron, an innovation in the early U.S. Navy. Thank you very much, Dr. Smith. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I just wanted to say from the, oh, wait until the lights come up. There we go. You can advance one more. I've likely been stressing myself half to death over this presentation for the past few months, so I apologize if I'm a little bit flaky. Um, but the presentation that I'm giving today is an extract from my recently completed master's thesis, which I turned in at the beginning of August. And my work into Commodore James Barron, or as he's commonly known, Commodore James Barron the Younger, grew out of my research into uh, Revolutionary War naval history specializing in Virginia where his father, James Barron the Elder, was uh, the third and final Commodore of that service, uh, served from 1780 until 1787 as a top officer in the Revolutionary War Navy. His two sons, James the Younger and Samuel Barron, would go on to become prominent officers of the United States Navy in the late 1790s. Um, one of the major inspirations for my work was a book by William Oliver Stevens called An Affair of Honor, and uh, there, there was one major issue with this book. It was written in the 1940s, wasn't published until the late 1960s, after the author had passed away. In the intervening years, all of his notes and bibliography had been lost. So while this book turned me on to a lot of interesting things about James Barron, I had to go through and find the references, start over again from scratch. And uh, Mr. Stevens also had the tendency to exaggerate a, a fair bit his subject's accomplishments, so that made it a little bit more difficult for me to find out what really happened, but I think I've uh, uh, put together a pretty good paper here. Um, one of the interesting questions that I was never able to answer was where Commodore James Barron came by his innovative spirit. He was never one really known for records in combat. Apparently he was a great thinker. He offered numerous technical and organizational improvements to the early United States Navy. But where did this innovation mindset come from? I, I couldn't really find any references to that. His formal schooling was cut short at about the age of 11 when he joined the Virginia Revolutionary War Navy as well. But uh, his innovative mindset was already established by the time he joined the frigate United States as a lieutenant in the year 1798, when he was repeatedly made fun of for constantly thinking up new ways of doing things. 
And uh, if you would advance on to the next slide, please. I'm trying to do it. Um, there's little scholarship on James Barron as well. First of all, I hinted at it before, never really known for a record in combat uh, during the Quasi War with France and the first Barbary War with Tripoli. James Barron uh, served aboard a number of different ships. He reached command rank relatively early after spontaneously re-rigging the frigate United States during a storm, uh, thus preserving all three of the ship's masts, presenting, preventing severe damage to the vessel. But beyond that, to most of his duties, even when he went on to command ships on his own, were uh, routine convoy escorts, supply missions, the occasional diplomatic foray. There uh, wasn't really any opportunity for combat that would bring prominence to people like Thomas Truxton, Stephen Decatur, Edward Preble, and others. And uh, if you'll advance to the next slide, please. Barron was also at the center of two of the more unfortunate incidents in early US naval history, one of them being in June of 1807, he was the officer in operational command of the USS Chesapeake when she was forced to strike her colors to HMS Leopard. He was court-martialed as a result of that, suspended from the Navy for five years, uh, was caught abroad during the War of 1812 as a merchant captain, was unable to afford a return voyage to the United States until 1818. If those circumstances weren't bad enough, in 1820, he shot the foremost naval hero of the day, Commodore Stephen Decatur Jr., in a duel uh, over fallout continuing fallout from the decisions over the Chesapeake Leopard affair. So there's not been too much attention paid to him. But uh, if you go on to the next slide, uh, this was essentially my big thesis statement. Uh, despite the fact that James Barron had a combat record that you could call uh, lackluster at best, uh, non-existent at worst, he spent most of his career offering uh, uh, suggestions for improvement to the early U.S. Navy. And uh, this going to concentrate on what previous authors have identified as the four biggest ones. Uh, early flag signals used by the United States Navy, uh, shipboard ventilation systems, a steam-powered for river and harbor defense, and his uh, influence on the uh, education of naval officers in the early 1940s. Uh, I do want to point out, though, I'm literally just scratching the surface and putting together a 20,000-word thesis the, those four major innovations filled it up pretty quickly. There is still a lot of other work to be done. And as Dr. Smith was saying, I hope to correct a lot of that with a full book some point in the future. But uh, we'll go ahead and get into the meat of what James Barron did. If you'll advance to the next slide, please. Uh, early naval signals. Um, there was a pretty common practice when the Continental Navy was fighting uh, Great Britain at sea during the American Revolution. Uh, leadership looked to the British Navy as a model for how things were done. Uh, early American naval regulations were modeled off of the, modeled off of the British Articles of War. Uh, the same trend continued when the Navy was permanently reestablished in the 1790s. Uh, one of the ways that we looked to them for sort of how to do things was in the use of flag signals to pass messages between warships at sea. Uh, in the early days of the United States Navy, Secretary of the Navy Benjamin Stoddart uh, consulted with a British Admiral, uh, George Vandeput, and they put together a series of joint recognition signals so the British and the American ships could recognize each other, not shoot at each other when they were really both looking to beat up on um, Thomas Truxton uh, published what is widely accepted as the United States Navy's first signal book in 1797. But even with the publication of that book, uh, joint signals between Great Britain and the United States, there were multiple sets of signals in use at any given time, uh, as was the tradition in the British Navy um, individual ship captains escorting merchant ships on convoys frequently created their own sets of signals for those specific situations. So it's really hard to say there was any one set of naval signals in use at the time. And on this slide, you've got some excerpts from all three. Truxton on the left. Uh, the one in the middle was actually drawn by uh, James's older brother, Samuel Barron, uh, leading a merchant convoy. And uh, if you'll advance to the next slide, please. Uh, James Barron, as a young lieutenant, Almost immediately upon joining the U.S. Navy, he found the signals that were in use at the time to be completely insufficient for the needs of the service. And being someone that uh, tried to offer solutions to these things, um, he volunteered. He spent most of his time that wasn't taken up by his regular duties for the next two years creating a revised set of signals. Uh, one problem I had in researching this is there aren't any specific details as to which set of signals Barron found to be insufficient. Um, he mentions uh, 136 signals included in the, the code that he was looking to revise. Truxton's contained just under 300. 
there is a reference to uh, Captain John Barry, who was uh, Barron's commanding officer aboard the United States, that suggests Barron was responding more directly uh, to the British signals uh, being in use. But um, Barron's work on signals received the encouragement both of John Barry and Secretary Stoddard. Uh, the Secretary of the Navy ordered a print run completed. Barron promptly had 150 copies of the new signal book run off. Uh, the book wasn't officially adopted until 1801. By that time, Robert Smith was the new Secretary of the Navy, so Stoddard get, didn't get to see the uh, conclusion. But uh, allegedly, Barron's signal book remained in general use by the U.S. Navy until it was captured at some point during the War of 1812. But uh, another, if you'll advance to the next slide, there is another issue. Um, aside from the fact that Barron does the, the records don't indicate which signals Barron was looking to replace. Uh, Barron's signal book is extremely rare, probably having something to do with the fact that after it was captured during the War of 1812, the Navy Department uh, supposedly ordered all surviving copies destroyed. So there weren't any reference pages. This Thomas Truxton's signal book is rare on its own, but a few copies still exist. Uh, the picture on this slide is one of the few excerpts that survive uh, relating to Barron's signals, whether these were his initial system or revisions he offered to make later on remains to be seen. The page itself was undated, but the signals that are here offer something troublesome in terms of improving efficiency in the system. Uh, as you can see, there are four two-colored flags that can be used in a matrix to produce all 26 letters of the alphabet. Uh, some of these letters would require one flag, some would require two. Flags were hoisted on particular masts. The major drawback to this system was each letter requires its own hoist. On the far right of the slide, you can see where the word enemy is spelled out. Five hoists, one for E-N-E-M-Y, and that's just one word saying there's an enemy, no indication of bearing or strength. I'm sure you can imagine how long it would have taken using this system to produce Nelson's famous signal, England expects that every man will do his duty. Trafalgar would have been over with. <laughs> but, um, after the Baron signers were captured during the War of 1812, the U.S. Navy adopted an abbreviated system that used Baron's original book as a copy, uh, well, as a key to the system. The only difficulty was, is since most of Baron's signal books had been destroyed, officers were expected to rely on their memory of what that previous signal was, and uh, Baron referred to the result as a, a very dangerous absurdity. And beginning in the 1830s, Barron began advocating to the Secretary of the Navy, later on to the United States Congress, to revise the signals. Let me start over from the beginning. I'll produce something good for you. But uh, as time went on, uh, members of the House Committee on Naval Affairs decided that, yes, indeed, the signals in uh, use were currently deficient. Uh, they passed a bill through the House of Representatives uh, authorizing the president to appoint three naval captains to revise the code of signals but whether that bill actually passed the House. Those details haven't survived, nor is there any mention of uh, James Barron being concluded on that panel. So as far as the direct evidence indicates, after the 1830s, Barron saying the signals are horrible, nothing, ex nothing exists to say what was done about it. But a, a good takeaway from this work on signals, and we can advance one more slide. I think I'm, I'm jumping ahead here. But... Um, what we can take away from Barron's work on signals in the 1830s was the fact that this grew out of a very junior officer, a lieutenant, not even in the service for a year, is already suggesting ways that the service can be improved, and this was a tendency that stuck with him throughout the rest of his career. But uh, if you'll advance one more slide, one of the innovations of Barron's that actually got some significant uh, traction was that of a shipboard ventilator meant to purify the air aboard ship. Uh, was very common during the age of sail. In fact, I don't really think it's changed too much through warfare, where disease tended to kill as many, if not more, people than actual combat operations. During the age of sail, it was even worse. There's a blurb from the Virginia Gazette in 1773 where um, a study was conducted saying over 130,000 British sailors were killed during the Seven Years' War, what we know as the French and Indian War. Uh, only about 1,300 were killed as the result of combat operations uh, the rest were through disease, uh, fully 70, uh, fully 75,000 or so were as the result of scurvy. So disease was a major issue when ships went on to tropical stations, uh, Cuba, off the coast of Africa, for example, yellow fever was a major ravager. And even though clean air wouldn't prevent the mosquito bite that would give you yellow fever, clean air wouldn't prevent the loss of vitamin C that brings on scurvy, foul atmosphere aboard ship, 
was uh, thought to exacerbate the situation. So um, throughout the 1700s, there were numerous attempts to uh, come up with new ways of purifying the air aboard ship. Uh, one of them included um, Dr. Stephen Hale's uh, bellows ventilator uh, for uh, cleaning out air aboard ships. Samuel Sutton did something similar, except he used a system of pipes connected to the ship's galley fire meant to circulate the air through convection. Uh, unfortunately, the British Navy never got too far with these and both um, systems were rejected by the end of the 1750s. But uh, if you'll advance one more slide, we will have a, uh, a good indication as to what made James Barron uh, want to work on ventilators specifically. His first independent command after being promoted out of the United States was a sloop of war called the USS Warren. And um, Warren was in the process of returning from a cruise where more than half of her crew had been stricken by yellow fever. 39 out of the 160 individuals were killed outright. One of the people that died at sea was the ship's captain who died several days after his young son, serving as a midshipman on the same ship, died of yellow fever as well. And Barron spent the next two months with the Warren in port trying to uh, relieve the sick, improve the situation aboard. It was another few months before Secretary Stoddard considered the Warren ready for sea again and actually sent them out. A, uh, a serious issue like this, it's easy to see why James Barron would have wanted to think about ventilators himself. But uh, if you'll advance another slide, we'll see what he came up with. This became known as the Barron Eater, uh, eventually, uh, from one of his more enthusiastic supporters. James Barron developed beginning in the early 17th, beginning in the early 1820s, continuing through the next decade, the development of a bellows, ventil bellows ventilator the bellows connected to a uh, central cylinder, approximately six inches in diameter, giant copper pipe, which fastened between the bellows and the ship's keel. A smaller network of copper pipes, about two inches in diameter, spread throughout the ship, meant to go in between spaces in between the timbers. And the system of pipes was meant to be as closed as possible so you could direct the entire force of the bellows to sucking the air out from in between the layers of planking between the ships. And uh, Barron's system seemed to be fairly effective in early tests aboard the USS Hornet. A crew of six was able to use this ventilator pumping for 15 minutes, completely changed the air trapped in the hole. And uh, it was by a simple test that they knew they had done their job. Once the air that's being squirted out of the ventilator no longer stank of bilge water, then they knew they had had the job done. And uh, if you'll advance one more slide, uh, Barron's ventilator was installed aboard numerous ships of the United States Navy uh, in the 1720s and 1730s. Uh, its use aboard USS Hornet got the most attention. Uh, in previous cruises, a Hornet, like Warren, had been known as a very sickly ship. But beginning in a year between 1724 and 1725, War um, Hornet rather was deployed to Cuba, hotbed of yellow fever. Um, Captain Kennedy of the Hornet ordered the ventilator put in motion for 15 minutes every four hours. And as a result of this, for that entire year of cruising, uh, the ship surgeon Weisenthal reported they only had one death from disease. And it wasn't even yellow fever. 1824, yes. I, I work in the 1700s, I write in the 1800s. I apologize, but only uh, one death from disease wasn't even yellow fever. The ship surgeon pointed out that when yellow fever did inevitably break out aboard ship, again, the mosquito bites, it didn't uh, 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 pass among the crew with the, the vir virulence that it was usually known for. Both Captain Kennedy and the ship surgeon attributed the, the healthful state of the ship to Barron's ventilator. And in fact, uh, Captain Kennedy wrote to Commodore David Porter, who was commanding the American squadron on station, you need to have this thing copied, put aboard all of the ships. Uh, Captain Kennedy eventually moved on to the ship of the line, Delaware. He had Barron's ventilator installed there, again aboard the frigate Brandywine when he was transferred on. Uh, the ship's ventilator was used aboard numerous other vessels. It even got attention from a French admiral uh, commanding in the West Indies. He went aboard the USS John Adams, it admired the, the use of the ventilator. He received permission to draw a diagram and copy it for the use of the French Navy. But once again, the paper trail fades out where he took it back. There's I haven't been able to find evidence yet that it was used elsewhere. One of the more interesting points was Kennedy's successor as a captain of the Hornet, and you can advance one more slide, was a man named Alex Claxton. And Claxton was such a big uh, proponent. He's the one that named the ventilator the Baronator, as a matter of fact. He wrote to the Secretary of the Navy at one point, I consider it a thorough safeguard against local fever. I will not willingly go to sea without another one. 
So that seems to be a very uh, a profound uh, a very profound recommendation to the uh, ventilator's use and the uh, ship. Ugh, I forgot how to speak. Once again, the, the ventilator never really got out of the testing phase. It was used aboard a handful of ships. Uh, by the time it was patented in 1835, Barron was hoping to sell his patent rights to the United States government, thereby allowing him to give the ventilator to the nation. But once again, the Secretary of the Navy said, this is a great idea, go to Congress. He petitioned to Congress, spoke before the House Naval Affairs Committee. A bill was proposed to provide compensation. It was killed in the Committee of the Whole. So once again, Barron's petitions went nowhere. But uh, this is a, another, and this isn't anything against Barron's work itself. A historian named F.P. Ellis was writing on ventilator use in the early 1800s as well. Usually in the British Navy, he made the suggestion that no one really got very far with ventilator use of warships long as you had to power it by hand. Once steam and electricity became available to work the fans, then a lot more work was done on shipboard ventilation. So in this case, Barron was just ahead of his time. Uh, if you'll advance another slide, what I find to be one of the more uh, interesting uh, concepts Barron came up with was that of the prow ship. Uh, this was coming out of an incident in 1820 where an American whaler, the Essex, was rammed and sank by an angry sperm whale. And James Barron read about this incident and decided that really proves the concept that the ram had, really hasn't gone out of style in naval warfare. Um, as he was doing research in the 1820s, he was looking at the series of coastal fortifications uh, going up and down the American coastline after the War of 1812 to protect American harbors. He noticed that they had cost $25 million and they still weren't complete yet. He thought by themselves they weren't enough to protect American littoral waterways and they were pretty expensive on their own. So he decided he was going to create a steam-powered ram ship that would patrol waterways. This ship of his was never meant to go out into the open ocean. Ideally, it would be used to attack enemy ships that were passing into American harbors and rivers, especially if they're sheltering in American bays from foul weather. And the steam would allow the prow ship to attack at any angle it wished, uh, avoid retaliation against the, the most of the enemy broadsides. And uh, if you will advance one more slide, We've got a very rough image. This is from the James Barron papers at the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg of photographs that survived, a model that was presented to the Navy Department in 1827. Uh, Barron's prow ship was meant to be solid wood construction designed to be a little over 200 feet long. It was comprised of three separate hulls. The two outriding hulls were 20 to 30 foot thick of just solid wood. Their only function was to protect the paddle wheels which you can just barely see in the middle on either side of the main hull. And it was only the central hull that had any hollow space cleared out. It was to make room for uh, uh, fuel, the steam engines. There were three steam engines which would work together, conceivably propel the ship at velocities up to 10 knots, and a very minimal crew. Uh, Barron envisioned this ship to only be crewed by an engineer, a fireman, a pilot, and a helmsman, and just a handful of armed Marines. And uh, covering the whole of this ship was a two-foot thick solid deck of just wooden logs. And his theory was the two outriding hulls would be thick enough to resist any cannon fire at the time, could protect the paddle wheels and machinery. The solid deck up top would likely reflect any glancing blows, likely any mortar fire that was brought to bear against the ship. Now, uh, if you'll advance one more slide, uh, we'll get a little bit of information on the prow ship. The main reason the prow ship is named the prow ship was for a pyramidal prow that was put on the front. The ship was not to be armed at all in terms of cannon. Its only offensive measure was to be the ram. And the ram itself was to be uh, built into the forwardmost 50 foot of the structure connected directly to the ship's keel to provide added strength to the hull. At its widest point, this prow would have been 12 foot wide, it narrowed down to about three foot at the point, a solid oak or hickory, the hardest woods that could be brought on hand. And to top it off, the prow was to be covered in iron plating. Uh, up to six inches thick on the sides, up to 20 inch of plate on the point itself. The plates would overlap just a little bit to give them a serrated saw-like edge. And this prow was designed to ram a massive hole into any ship. And the, the idea was, was to put so large a hole that would admit so much water so quickly that it would resist any attempt that the crew could make to prevent sinking of the ship. And another advantage to the pyramidal prow was as the uh, stricken ship began to settle, it could slide off the ram fairly easily as the prow ship reversed. And uh, if you'll advance one more slide, please. Uh, the prow ship, just like everything else, 
it didn't get past Congress. Uh, Barron had several meetings with the House Committee on Naval Affairs. Congressman Henry A. Wise was a major supporter of his, uh, suggesting this. He introduced a bill to Congress uh, appropriating $75,000 to uh, construct a prototype of this prowl ship. Barron even uh, publicly said that he would be willing to pilot the prototype himself under the guns of Fortress Monroe in Virginia, and if you could penetrate and sink the prowl ship, I'll die happy. Um, but once again, the bill didn't get anywhere. It was defeated in the House. Uh, Barron at this point was becoming somewhat frustrated that uh, uh, numerous attempts of his at innovating were being stymied. Also by this time, 1835 to 1836, deterioration uh, was taking place in the relations between the United States and France. Uh, it, and this involved indemnities owed to the United States over the Quasi War from the uh, last years of the 1700s itself. Uh, President Andrew Jackson, uh, exacerbated matters a little bit with some strongly worded messages to Congress. So a new war seemed to be on the horizon. It, it's important to note that in 1828, James Barron was offered command of the United States squadron in the Pacific Ocean. It was actually a seagoing command. Something like this, especially after the Chesapeake affair, could have really restored his reputation. But the nation was at peace. He was in the process of appealing to the Kentucky legislature for land bounties still owed to his family after Revolutionary War service. And I imagine turning down that seagoing command uh, must have rankled him a little bit. It's something he apparently always regretted. Once again, he appealed to President Andrew Jackson directly. All of the other naval officials are persecuting me over Decatur, over the Chesapeake. They're being mean. We're about to go to war. Please give me a seagoing command. If you can't give me a traditional ship, let me build the prow ship and take that into battle against the French. I will happily do so. Unfortunately, about a month after he sent this appeal in February 1806, Great Britain offered to mediate between the United States and France the entire situation fizzled out. James Barron was never offered another seagoing command again. He would have to settle for shore duty. But uh, the prow ship had a little bit more of a future. If you'll advance one more slide, uh, Henry A. Wise, fast forwarding, uh, he became a, a member of the Confederate government in Virginia during the early years of the American Civil War. He'd always remembered what Barron had said about the prow ships, and he wrote to General Robert E. Lee commanding Virginia state forces saying what Barron had done and suggesting that Virginia should construct something similar to fight off the larger, uh, better supplied Union Navy. And But there's no indication that anything that ended up happening uh, with the ironclad Virginia um, doesn't seem to be any attention paid to Barron's ideas. The only uh, feature CSS Virginia had in common to Barron's prowlship was the ram, but the ram itself was constructed differently. It was just bolted onto the bow of the wreck of the USS Merrimack. It inclined upwards from the bottom. When they rammed USS Cumberland, the ram snapped off. So at that point, there was nothing, anything else done. An interesting assertion that William Oliver Stevens made, if you notice the USS Monitor on the bottom, he insisted that James Barron had invented the raft-like structure that Erickson used for the Monitor. Therefore, James Barron should be called the father of modern navies. But <laughs> Once again, none of his design elements were ever used. It seems like another major factor limiting his development was just the limits of steam technology at the time. Uh, Barron was working at a time before screw propellers had become a thing. If Barron had been able to work with a screw propeller, conceivably he wouldn't have needed those two outriding ships. He could have armed it and still kept the weight relatively low. So once again, Barron is thinking ahead. It seems as though he may have been ahead of his time. But if you'll advance one more slide, um, the, the last thing that Barron had uh, a really profound impact on was the training of midshipmen uh, during the mid-1800s. Uh, beginning all throughout the age of sail, it was common for midshipmen to pass a very rigorous oral examination in navigation and seamanship before they could be promoted to lieutenant. Uh, it was the same thing in the early United States Navy. Conceivably, midshipmen would spend uh, three years of duty at sea where they learn everything they need. They pass the midshipmen's exam. They're commissioned as officers. But the quality of education aboard ship depended upon the individual captains. There were some ship captains. Matthew Fontaine Morey wrote about this in his Scraps from the Lucky Bag in the 1840s. There were some captains that thought the art of navigation was just the purview of the captain and the sailing master. He wouldn't give his midshipmen any of that. Um, but uh, most of the emphasis was on seamanship in the uh, midshipmen's uh, examinations, um, rote memorization of popular textbooks like uh, Nathaniel Bowditch, the improved American practical navigator, for example, was considered all you would need to get through 
uh, through the 1830s, a series of schools were established at naval yards where they could learn the mathematics they need for navigation. Conceivably, they could go through and do self-study as to how ships were constructed uh, during the repair work in the yards. None of that worked especially well either, and the Navy Yard schools were all closed in 1839, but they were replaced by something else. Uh, if you'll advance one more slide, please. Uh, at the Philadelphia Naval Asylum, which was originally a home for uh, retired and infirm naval veterans, a preparatory school was established where midshipmen would conceivably spend eight months again learning uh, mathematics required for navigation in preparation for their midshipmen's exam. But the early naval school, it didn't really have a lot to it. The midshipmen met in a dark basement. There were bars on the windows to keep the midshipmen in across the yard where in the living quarters where the chambermaids for the naval hospital were kept. There were bars on the windows to keep the midshipmen out. Uh, discipline uh, among the midshipmen became a big problem. They felt they were being treated by children. They were being treated as children. So they had a tendency to show up to lectures uh, smoking three foot long Turkish cherry stem pipes. Uh, at one point, as a body, they all cultivated mustaches in process of being treated like children and violating Navy regulations to boot. Um, if you'll advance one more slide, uh, in 1842, Barron's last active duty assignment in the Navy was two years as governor of the Philadelphia uh, Naval Asylum, which gave him authority over the Naval School as well. He joined the asylum at the same time as Professor William Chauvenet, who was determined from the beginning to reform naval education, he wanted to propose a more rigorous curriculum, have their academic work counted towards their merit roles in the uh, examinations for lieutenant, really increase the book knowledge, diversify it a bit more. And he brought these ideas to Commodore Barron. Barron was very supportive of his work, gave him uh, all of the moral support he could. Uh, James Barron also went about uh, expanding the facilities. <clears throat> Almost finished, I'll, I'll, I'll hurry it up. But uh, Barron approved requisitions for sextants, marine chronometers, expanded the facilities. And what ended up happening in 1845, a significantly larger proportion of midshipmen passed the examination for lieutenant than had ever done so before as a direct result of Chauvenet's expanded curriculum, which was, of course, facilitated by Commodore Barron. And uh, as time went on, um, William Chauvenet went on to become one of the first faculty members at the Naval School established at Fort Severn. Well, we're kind of on the expanded version of that now. And a lot of that work that he did with Barron support at the Naval School in Philadelphia showed that classroom education for Naval officers was indeed viable. And uh, if you'll advance one more slide for me, uh, essentially this is the big conclusion. Once again, Barron will never really be known for his experience in combat. He is not one that would be considered rattling good history if you were to read about him. But like many other naval personnel, he was one of the people that worked behind the scenes. He was diligent in his duties. He spent decades serving in the Navy, trying to improve the service that he obviously cared a great deal about. And it's uh, uh, my intention to see if I can't bring a little bit more of that to life. But uh, with that, you can advance uh, one last slide. I want to thank you very much for your attention today. <laughs> And if you wish, I can give you my email address. If you want the full 20,000 words, I'd be happy to share. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Sam. Uh, that's very informative. Our next presentation today is by Sam Lim. Lim I'm having a hell of a time in that. Lemme or Denny O. Lemme. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I, can speak, I, can, I can say some Spanish words, but I can't say Lemneos. Uh, but he has served as an assistant archivist here at the United States Naval Academy Special Collection and Archives. He received his MA in military history from Norwich University and his MLIS from Drexel University and is currently a doctoral student at Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia, where he's studying the 19th century Naval Academy. Um, he is a five-year Army veteran, a former archives technician at the National Archives and Records Administration, he enjoys helping researchers navigate through Navy, military, and government records and documenting the institution's history at the United States Naval Academy. Today, his presentation is entitled, Development of the United States Naval Academy's Unwritten Honor Concept from 1865 to 1875. Sam? Thank you, Dr. Smith. Um, thank you all for coming to do this. How many of you are Naval Academy graduates? Anybody? That's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, this will be
be more, this will be very important to you. You'll, you'll probably feel more into your participation. Um, if you go to the next slide. The modern Naval Academy honor concept emphasizes integrity, honesty, and respect. Uh, the, mo the modern day honor concept is really the work of first class midshipman Ross Perot. You may know ran for president in the 1980s. Um, Ross Perot wrote a paper when he was a first classman in 1953 here at Annapolis, where he suspected that the superintendents were the ones who really articulated the Naval Academy honor concept during the 19th century. In his paper, he suggested that the superintendent's special orders address issues of moral turpitude um, during the 19th century because the, the Academy honor concept wasn't really formalized and published as a written honor concept until 1955. Um, until mo most modern historiography today that deals with the Naval Academy's honor traditions, the honor concept, really does not challenge Ross Perot's assertion that between 1865 and 1891, there was really nothing written about the honor concept. However, this paper will argue that between 1865 and 1875, the United States Naval Academy articulated and stewarded a vibrant, unwritten, yet institutionally endearing honor concept that emphasizes obedience, fairness, integrity, and personal responsibility, all undergirded by a strict discipline system for conduct offenses. Next slide. The superintendent or his representative publicly shamed midshipmen convicted of dishonorable conduct through the reading of orders in the 19th century at evening formations and parades on an almost daily basis. These superintendents' warnings and reprimands recorded in written orders remain the only evidence of this honor concept. And this is a picture of reading of orders in front of the old midshipmen's quarters, which used to stand roughly adjacent to uh, Mari Hall across, uh, across Decatur Road by the museum. These superintendents' orders and uh, idealized the honor, integrity, and chivalry that the Navy expected officers to demonstrate and is found only in passing mention in existing historiography. Next slide. On assuming the Academy superintendents in September 1865, Rear Admiral David Dixon Porter, brother of, adopted brother of Admiral Farragut and a cousin of um, uh, Dix John Porter, who was a Union general, uh, immediately implemented an honor-centered vision for the institution, emphasizing obedience, personal integrity, honesty, duty, trust, and fairness, all of this in response to midshipmen misconduct. Less than two weeks into the academic term, Porter cut an order disavowing midshipmen disobedience of orders, stating, quote, the first duty of an officer is to obey. The midshipmen are sent here to learn habits of discipline, as well as to be instructed in other matters belonging to the naval profession, quote cheating or trying, quote, by Porter, to get windward of a professor at every opportunity, quote, manifested first in November 1865. Porter acted quickly and publicly remarked that the offender, quote, has felt the punishment as an officer and gentleman should, quote. Next slide. Making his intentions clear, Porter stated, I have but one desire, and that is to send honorable men from this institution to the Navy. And I shall take every opportunity to impress upon all those under my charge the importance of abstaining from anything and everything that bears the least impress of dishonor. Quote. Shortly thereafter, Porter references the dishonor attached to negligent performance of guard duty and directed that offenses marked dishonorable conduct and conduct reports count against graduates in their final examination as deficient in conduct. In December 1865, Porter predicated midshipmen town liberty into Annapolis through the Academy's Gate 3, which is still here, without an issue pass on the honor concept. Midshipmen are both, quote, officers and gentlemen, wrote the superintendent. And I have endeavored to abolish every system of espionage in this institution, trusting to their honor as officers and gentlemen not to deceive me. Next slide. Porter invested incremental authority in all four midshipmen classes, with permanent leadership invested in a select first-class cad cadet officer cadre. Porter appointed third and fourth classmen to temporary rotational offices, such as midshipmen officer of the day and room and building, for superintendents. Favoritism quickly manifested as midshipmen overlooked their classmates and friends' violations in the authoritative positions logs and reports. Troubled by the midshipmen's frequent false reporting, Porter regretted such, quote, slow progress made in what I consider the first essential in the character of a naval officer. Quote. Next slide. False reports injure discipline and taint the midshipmen's integrity 
and Porter remarked, quote, I had hoped that the Naval Academy would become a school of honor in which everyone would pride himself in the performance of the slightest duty without regard to the feelings of anybody. Quote, Porter's insistence on honor and fairness laid out a clear moral vision for the Academy. Proud of the fruit that this system soon brought forth, Admiral Porter took every occasion to showcase the midshipman's zeal and character. On February 13, 1867, Porter praised the midshipman's performance at seamanship and artillery exercise exhibitions for a visiting Austrian Vice Admiral Wilhelm von Tigethoff by stating, quote, nations are much judged by the character of their naval officers. They may have three deckers and ironclads, but unless they are officered by zealous and well-taught men, they would prove of little use in time of battle. On assembling the midshipmen in September 1867 to commence the new academic term, Porter urged, take a fair start then, and all you do, no matter what it is or how trifling, do it well. Next slide. Porter's high-toned officership emphasized honor in reaction to falsehood, cowardliness, and hazing. Particularly harsh contempt accompanied condemnations of falsehood and pledge violations. Porter admonished one class of 1868 first-classmen for continuous subversion of this pledge to abstain from alcohol. Next slide. If after a midshipman reaches the first class, he fails to appreciate the value of the honorable character which should attach to an officer, Porter wrote, he is unfit to hold a position in the Navy. While Porter invested midshipmen with the responsibility to report regulation infractions, he detested vindictiveness, noticing that midshipmen would spitefully report one another over frivolous offenses a system known as spotting. Porter branded it as dishonorable. While Porter encouraged sportsmanship, competition, and courage, he equally eviscerated cowardliness, especially the absence of moral courage. When a group of midshipmen heckled an assistant professor by shouts and whooping from afar who they did not like, Porter denounced the cowardness, declaiming, if a person intends to insult, insult another, the courageous and manly course would be to come up squarely up to him, give him an opportunity to resent the insult on the spot, but to attack a man with a hooting crowd looks to me as if the young chivalry of the Navy is on the wane. Next slide. Despite persistent condemnation, Porter referred to hazing undergirding the third and fourth classes as, quote, nothing more than a cowardly attack on young and inexperienced boys by those who, if they had just one spark of chivalry in them, would hold out the right hand of fellowship and aid their juniors. Porter's term ending, his successors looked favorably on his administration, and contemporary historians enshrined his efforts to establish a clear, honor-centered moral vision at the Naval Academy. Next slide. Porter stewarded the Academy superintendents from September 1865 to October 1869. Porter's successor, Commodore John Lorimer Warden, the namesake of our Warden Field, the famous commander of the USS Monitor, in her fight with the, with the Merrimack at the Battle of Hampton Roads in 1862, took over the academy in October 1869. Neglect of duty, drunkenness, puerile behavior, cheating, fighting, and academic deficiency took on an increased frequency at the onset of Warden's superintendents between 1869 and 1870. In April, Warden publicly appealed to the midshipmen, quote, on the score of pride and self-interest, not to jeopardize through criminal idleness or carelessness a career of so much honor that is that upon which they are just entered. Demonstration of midshipman honor also ameliorated punishment. When a second class cadet midshipman's failure to return from liberty forced the Academy's summer crew sailing squadron to strand him in London by himself in 1870, Warden condemned the, the quote, breach of trust, quote, while citing the midshipman's previous good conduct and standing, strict attention to duty, quote, and the fact that he seems to have been actuated by a high sense of honor in his unwillingness to leave his hotel until he could liquidate a necessary bill that he had contracted. Quote. Next slide. Like his predecessor, Warden also rebuked the, quote, pernicious practice of favoritism among the midshipmen in public orders. An officer, Warden read on parade to the assembled midshipmen, quote, should never make any difference between friend or foe in matters of duty nor would any man with proper views of right and responsibility do so. Warden refused to believe the midshipmen approbated the guilty midshipmen's unwarrantable motives. Quote, otherwise, he could have little hope for the future of the Navy, whose offers must, if it is a credit to the country, be high-toned, 
honorable, and reliable. While inheriting his predecessor's visionary leadership and moral vision, Warden impressed his own sense of honor on the midshipmen. In early January 1871, Warden laid out an inspiring standard of honorable conduct in a series of orders censoring midshipmen for cheating. Warden stated, quote, the loftiest sentiments of chivalry should at all times form the guide of an officer's conduct, Warden stated, because our whole system of discipline and subordination is founded upon honor, a rock of adamant that if once undermined will not fail to bring in its fall the whole proud fabric it has hitherto so firmly and successfully supported. Next slide. Later that month, a serious cheating scandal necessitated a special investigation board. Warden took the high road and called on the midshipmen's honor to uncover the gougers, which is the word for cheating in academy lingo. Young men seeking office in the Navy, a service, Warden added, noted, quote, if possible, above all others, for the high and delicate sense of honor, which has been from its infancy so marked a characteristic of its officers, should surely from the very beginning of their professional lives strive to cultivate this, end quote. Directly criticizing the gouging midshipmen's hypocritical just indignation, Warden averred, quote, those whose faces would flush and whose young blood would boil at the faintest whisper breathed against their reputation have cheated their instructors. To Warden's great pleasure, within only one week, all four classes of midshipmen formed committees and submitted their own pledges to discontinue gouging at the academy. In reaction to the worst human instincts, Warden also articulated an almost aristocratically inferred midshipman responsibility to treat others with charity, uprightness, and kindness. In early February 1872, vulgar insults exchanged between two mids devolved into a scandalous and dangerous fight involving a knife. Next slide. Stressing every pop proper gentleman in naval officer's motto of noblesse oblige, quote, Warden condemned the fight and stated before the assembled cadet midshipmen, quote, the academy is designed as a school for the cultivation of a delicate sense of honor and of other high moral qualities, as well as for the education of the intellectual faculty. And it matters not how great may be the efficiency attained in the later regards. If the former should be neglected, the academy is a failure. Great trials tested both Warden and his successor's vision with Naval Academy honor. Next slide. Rear Admiral Christopher Raymond Perry Rogers assumed the Academy superintendence on September 22, 1874. Hailing from two famous American naval families, the Perrys and the Rogers, Rogers' commanding intellect and lineage emanated aristocratic professionalism. For example, Rogers dealt with the recurring antagonism between line and engineering cadet divisions by censoring the derogatory slur greaser, which cadet midshipmen used to insult their cadet engineer colleagues by stressing the proper, quote, decorum, which gentlemen habitually use in their intercourse with each other. Next slide. Like his predecessors, Rogers also stressed honor in rebuking serious conduct offenses. In publicly denouncing theft, Rogers emphasized, there should be no difference in the codes of honor that guides naval cadets and naval officers. And he denounced the, quote, false system of ethics, which is said to have grown up here, wholly incompatible with that high honor, which is the chief characteristic of our Navy. And publicly condemning a cadet midshipman for repeatedly violating his pledge to abstain from drinking alcohol, Rogers wrote, quote, the word of a naval officer must always be held sacred. In reprobating the, quote, schoolboy favoritism, inducing fourth classmen to sign false building and floor superintendent reports, Rogers cautioned, quote, after this warning, every cadet must feel that he owes it to his own honor as gentlemen and naval officers, never to put his signature to a statement that is not absolutely true. Quote, while Rogers prescribed a similar honor-centered vision to conduct offenses, Rogers also faced greater difficulties, and hard issues soon tested Rogers' high-toned vision of Academy Chivalry. Next slide. On a parade held in early November 1874, Rogers reduced a first-class cadet midshipman section leader to the ranks for publicly insulting cadet midshipman Henry E. Baker, the third African-American to attend 
the school, stating, quote, every gentleman should instinctively shrink from offering an indignity to one unable to resent it. And all well-bred persons are habitual, even to those with whom they may desire to avoid familiar intercourse. Quote, in response to Baker, Baker's unwarranted beating with fists and sticks on his return from dinner by two fellow fourth classmen on February 7th and February 8th, 1875, Rogers secured the offender's prompt dismissal from the service and to prevent the, quote, scandals of the last 24 hours, quote, he placed the entire fourth class under strict military cadet officer transportation to all meals and drills, which means no talking, absolutely no fun at all. And he prescribed extra infantry drills during Wednesday and Saturday recreation hours until further orders. Naturally discouraged as antithetical to personal honor, Rogers's use of mass punishment reflects the challenge posed to the Academy's delicate sense of honor by human nature's worst impulses. Next slide. The punishments prescribed during this period provide vital context to the Academy's unwritten honor concept. And so now I will go over some of the punishments during the 19th century. Next slide. The Academy's 1865 regulations enjoined midshipmen to conduct themselves on, quote, every occasion with the propriety and decorum which characterizes the society of gentlemen. Lying, prevarication, cheating, hazing, theft, fraud, disobedience, gross disrespect, and drunkenness all constituted serious conduct offenses, and Academy regulations stipulated various punishments during the period that underlay the honor concept's development. So in this picture, you can see Amid smoking in his room, thinking of all the future pleasures that his naval career will give him. Next slide. For such conduct offenses, Admiral Porter routinely locked midshipmen up on bread and water in solitary confinement. For falsely using his church liberty to go into Annapolis and get drunk at a local bar, Porter locked up three class of 1868 graduates in the guardhouse, in, in, in the dark guardhouse with no lantern, for a week in December 1865. Next slide. And now we see what happens when Admiral Porter catches the midshipmen smoking in his room, and his dreams turn quickly into stern realities. Between December 5th, 1867, and January 15th, 1868, Porter placed 14 midshipmen in both dark and light room diet restricted solitary confinement for offenses including falsehood, violating church liberty, fighting, drinking liquor, gambling, using insulting language, and tampering with official papers. Between 1865 and 1875, over a 10 year period, Porter, Warden, and Rogers placed over 75 midshipmen in light room and dark room solitary confinement in publicly read orders. Next, oh, excuse me, same slide. Despite portrayal as an informal midshipman sanctioned social ostracism by some historians, Academy authorities officially prescribed Coventry for serious conduct offenses. Official Coventry prohibited offending midshipmen from all non-official social interaction with others, including at meals and in sleeping quarters, and separated them in special groups during all roll calls, formations, and parades. Next slide. Porter publicly reprimanded those caught taking French leave or unauthorized liberty and published his hope that the guilty, quote, are only stray specimens in impropriety, such as are found floating on the surface in all communities, and that the midshipmen generally will place them in Coventry, as I have done. Quote. Next slide. In one of the first documents publicly evidencing a misconduct case, examined by a board of cadets composed of gentlemen of reputation and intelligence, Rogers, Superintendent Rogers, placed a cadet midshipman in official Coventry for equivocation or trying to evade the truth in 1875, and stressed, quote, those cadets who prize truth and honor will avoid one of their number who have proven himself unworthy of their association, end quote. Between 1865 and 1875, the Academy authorities placed 30 midshipmen in Coventry in publicly read orders. Next slide. Another prevalent punishment during the period was confinement to the USS Santee, a frigate from the Civil War that served as a barrack ship and later as a prison ship for 
midshipmen who were convicted of conduct and honor offenses. The confinement to the CNT placed offenders under constant strict military discipline. And that's a picture of the CNT, which sat in what today, if you look on your maps, you see the CNT basin at the academy. That's why it's called the CNT basin. Next slide. After the standard weekdays completion and formally sanctioned CNT party comprising confined midshipmen who suffered punishment by being restricted to the barrack ship were marched to the ship's moorings at the academy wharf where they remained under strict shipboard naval discipline until morning assembly. The first publicly reported midshipmen confinement to the CNT occurred on November 18, 1871. Between that date and October 1875, Warden and Rogers confined at least 106 midshipmen to the CNT in written orders read on parade to all of their colleagues. Next slide. Excuse me. Same, same slide. For less severe conduct cases, the authorities pres prescribe the proportionately lighter, strict quarantine punishment. Essentially, confinement to quarters, strict quarantine forbade the offender all liberty, leave, and rotational authoritative positions permitting travel only to recitations, meals, religious services, parades, drills, and exercises. Between 1865 and 1875, the academy superintendent placed at least 350 cadet midshipmen in strict quarantine through publicly read orders, and 162 of these were placed in strict quarantine for over 30 days. Next slide. The Naval Academy's modern honor concept is the product of incremental developments over 176 years through publicly read declamatory orders reprimanding misconduct. The 19th century academy superintendents encouraged midshipmen to cultivate a delicate sense of honor for themselves in the officer corps. Between 1865 and 75, the academy developed and maintained a high-spirited, unwritten, yet institutionally resilient honor concept, emphasizing obedience, fairness, integrity, and personal responsibility. And all of this was supported by a strict disciplinary culture. I want to conclude my paper by thanking all of you here and the McMullen Committee for allowing me to present and for all of my audience here and everybody joining us virtually. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. Okay, our last presentation today is also in the Age of Cell, and it's going to be by Edder. Antonio de Jesus Gallegos Ruiz, or let's call him Edder Gallegos. Uh, he's a PhD candidate in history and humanistic studies at Pablo de Olivide University in Seville, Spain. And since January 2015, he's also been a researcher assigned to the international group Contractor State Group Imperial Network in Spain, assigned to the project, quote unquote, business networks and state administration, the production of strategic materials in the Hispanic world as a scenario of early globalization in the 19th century at the National Autonomous University of Mexico from 2018 to 2021. The title of his presentation today, and being from Texas, I, I was very intrigued with this one. Uh, the birth of Mexico's naval power in 1821, a historical study in honor of its bicentennial. Edder, please join us. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith, and uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for, for this uh, moment. It's an honor for me. And um, um, first of all, uh, an apology for my poor English, but it's a, it's a Hispanic month, and uh, thank you for, for, the, for the moment. This is a, a great pleasure for me. Okay, the the birth of Mexico's naval power in 1821, historical study in honor of its bicentennial. Uh, so the birth of the Mexico's navy was a historic process of technological and political matter. On September 27, 1921, the Trigaret army under the command of Agustin de Iturbide entered to Mexico City. The following day, the act of Mexico's independence was seen. After these events, the majority of Spanish military garrisons uh, surrendered unconditionally. However, 
This did not mean submission of the total Spanish troops that were still in the territory, in the most important port of Mexico, a new Spain, Veracruz port, the Spanish garrison under the command of Brigadier Jose Maria Davila refused to recognize the independence of Mexico. On the night of October 26, he moved of the castle of San Juan de Ulua, and from there he decided to make resistance while waiting for new Spain reinforcement from abroad, that case from Cuba. The Spanish garrison was composed for around 200 soldiers and sailors who took the artillery from Veracruz and disabled the rest of the pieces that they could not move. Installed in the fortress, the Spanish garrison in San Juan de Lua, he established a correspondence with the royal authorities of Havana. To receive logistical support, the situation worried the authorities of Mexico City but more to the population in the port of Veracruz, in the Gulf of Mexico. The heavy caliber of Spanish pieces, uh, around 24 pounds, was a real threat at any moment they could bombard the city. A short time before, uh, a short time before the Secretary of War and Navy of Mexico created on October 4th, but the Mexican realty was marked by the lack of one qualified military personnel. There was not enough heavy caliber weaponry or foundries to make cannons. In fact, during eight years, two years, the Mexico only had 60 pieces of artillery. Did not have either a large shipyard or strong warships. Uh, sorry for the, the micro for someone, okay. Uh, meanwhile, the Regency Mexican government commissioned the Capitan Eugenio Cortez and Azua to the United States of America to acquire some ships to form the first squadron that had to expulse the Spanish troops in Ulua. This is the fortress of Ulua. The ships acquired by Cortez were the schooners Iguala and Anahuac, the sloops Campechana, Chalco, Chapala, Texcoco, Orizaba. Tuxman, Zumpango, Tampico, Papa Woman, and the Tlaxcalteca, carrying artillery pieces, maybe manufactured in the iron foundry of West Ham in Virginia. Also, the initial project included the acquisition of a frigate and eight corvettes. The first Mexican warship to arrive from Delaware was the 12 gun schooner called Iguala which arrived in Veracruz on April and 1822, piloted by American Captain John Davis. In this way, the Mexican Navy formally began, but the conditions of the captain and the conditions of the pound cannons uh, is not the property for uh, to arrest the firepower of the fortress in Spanish possession. The recruitment of sailors in the local towns of Veracruz, uh, and even from South America, English sailors and American sailors, and the acquisition of naval technology made them tense the relations between the Mexican government and the Udua Spanish authorities. On September 10, 1922, the General Antonio Lopez de Santana took over the Mexican government of the city of Veracruz. And the Spanish authorities of Lua changed from Jose Maria Davila to Brigadier Francisco Lemur. Under the Lemur responsibility, the first bombing of the city of Veracruz was carried out in the early morning on October 27, as a reaction to cheated by General Santana, who made the Spaniards believe that he would surrender the city without any resistance. On November 9, the Mexican government gave Brigadier Lemur an ultimatum within 48 hours to leave the fortress of San Juan de Lua, and if he did not do so, he would provide of naval supply. At the time the ships of the first squadron that began to patrol the Ulua area, it was very useful to have a base on the island of sacrifice 
near to Ulua Fortress to create an anchorage where to take refuge to resist the weather. On August 23, the Minister of War and Navy, General Jose Joaquin of Herrera, issued instructions to General Guadalupe Victoria to occupy Safe Island, the Island of Sacrifice, by placing at the disposal three gunboats in Albania, mainly with all available sailors, ammunition, and infantry. From the city of Puebla, he will be sent an infantry regiment composed by 200 men and part of the other regiment. However, the Rojalist Brigadier went ahead and took Spanish possession of the Island of Sacrifice on September 21, posing a double threat to the city of Puebla. In addition, Mexican artillery was placed in strategic places in Mocambo Beach on a battery for guns was erected there under the command of Jose Maria del Toro, who arrived with uh, 100 infantry elements. Two other battery were also placed outside of the walls of the city. In response, the city of Veracruz, uh, that, that's the, the city of Veracruz near to Fortress of San Juan de Lua, the city of Veracruz suffered the second bombardment from Spaniards in Ulua on September 25, 1923. In just two days, from November 8 to 11, there was a rain for around 600 cannonballs and 200 bombs. The Mexican, the Mexican coastal batteries respond by firing 19 and 159 cannonballs at the fortress. The Spanish force continued to open fire from the San Juan de Lua without a solution on the horizon. Since September 30, the General Guadalupe Victoria had assumed command of military operations. From the Mexican Ministry of State and Office of War and Navy, he received the order to appoint Jose Maria Tosta as a command of the Department of the Navy and the Naval Squad in Veracruz. The Mexican force fire against the fortress of San Juan de Lua, the fire will be made from the Mocambo coastal batteries or the artillery fire of the Mexican warship was limited. The only strategy was a naval, a naval blockade. The formal declaration of naval blockade by Mexico was made on October 8, 1923, through which Spanish ships were forced to leave Mexican ports in a period of around 24 hours, or the other side, they will be attacked by the national ships and ships from the Grand Colombia. It was uh, for, for, forbidden to establish relations with the Spanish garrison of San Juan de Lua. Vessels that did not comply, comply with this decree would be In this way, in late October, the arrival of the Spanish frigate Fama from Cadiz to Lua was prevented by the Mexican war schooner Iguala. Meanwhile, the population of Veracruz had to resist the bombardment until the end of the year. In correspondence between Guadalupe Victoria, the general, and the Mexican Minister of War and Navy, dated November 21, it was testified that the supply situation in the city was prepared and that the necessary support was not being received. General, the General Guadalupe Victoria was uh, unsuccessfully trying to get fresh food for the Mexican sailors and the military garrison in Veracruz. Consequently, during the bombing, an epidemic claimed a third, uh, a third of the hungry population, and in words of the historian Juan Ortiz, they were more afraid of the epidemic and hunger than cannonballs. Spanish gunboats frequently led Ulua to make rapid attacks towards the Veracruz docks, but all the incursions were successfully refused by the Mexican government. In the meantime, the lack of food in Ulua and the continuous death of the Spaniards to yellow fever forced to gradually cease the problem. It is necessary to point out that even there were a temporary ceasefire for religious cause. On December 12, 1923, 
the Mexican <laughs> and the Spanish sites made a brief ceasefire in honor of the celebration of Virgin of Guadalupe. This detail, this detail in the war report of the following day, written by the Guadalupe Victoria, protected in the historical archive of the Secretary of National Defense in Mexico City. Meanwhile, the same day of the Virgin of Guadalupe was used by the commissioners of the British government, uh, Leon Harvey, Henry Ward, and Charles O'Gorman, to deliver arms and ammunition sold to the Mexican government. But the Spanish force to, of Lua continued trying to organize an expedition to strengthen their position and unlock the naval blockade. In an attempt to capture Sacrifice Island on March 18, 1924, Brigadier Lemur sent two Spanish boats, which could not ride for the firing of the Mexican cannon battery in the Ocamo Beach. This caused a third bombardment against the city of Veracruz. This lasted until the March 21 on Mocambo Beach. In addition to the artillery battery, a furnace had been installed for the application of what is known as Bala Roja, uh, uh, a red bullet, a destructive incendiary technology against ships. By order of the General Manuel Rincón, Jose Maria Tosca took Sacrifice Island for Mexico on November 9, prepare and space for the safe anchoring of the ships that would support the blockade and build a coastal artillery battery with improvised parapets, forcing the Spanish supply ships to anchor far, far away in the Verde Island. However, the situation of the Mexican naval squadron was still difficult since it continued with scarce funds to pay the crew, continually having almost empty ships. Despite these difficulties, on January the 5, 1925, the schooner Anahuac and the sloop Tampico chased a foreign pilot boat that threatened to supply Ulua. The naval skirmish stopped in the afternoon due to a strong wind, but finally was sunk by the shots of canyons from Veracruz. At the beginning of the year, after the recognition of the independence of Mexico by the British government, Mexican minister Mariano Michelena uh, managed to get a loan with the English house, Berkeley, with which he was able to buy some larger warships in London. The Frigate Libertad and the Brinks Bravo and Victoria. That arrived between June and July 1925. On August, on August 16, the Mexican, the Mexican government ordered the Capitan Pedro Sainz de Baranda as general commander of the Veracruz Department of the Navy and the naval squad in Veracruz. Uh, he had a long career as a sailor and naval gunner in the Spanish Navy, highlighting his participation 20 years ago when he was a young Guarda Marina in one of the most important naval battles in history. On board on ship Santa Ana, he served against the British ship Royal Sovereign at the naval battle of Trafalgar. Meanwhile, from Havana, Cuba, there was a new attempt to supply Ulua. On September 90, 1925, a Spanish convoy made up by the frigates Santa Sabina and Santa Casilda and the corvette Aretusa set sail accompanied by two American brigantines. By October 5, the ships were seen for Mexicans, but the next day a storm dissipated them while the Mexican squadron anchored on the Isla of Sacrificios, Sacrifice, got ready for a possible combat in the early morning of October 11. The Spanish outposts approached the Mexican squad. The Fregat Libertad, the Victoria and the Bravo Briggs, the Papaloapan, Tampico, Orizaba and Chalco sloops, as well as the Federal pilot boat. The risk of the naval combat could be assumed by Mexico, 
since uh, the guns of the Spaniards frigates were balanced with the toes of the Brigade Libertad and the Brigantines Bravo and Victoria from Mexico. Those of the Spanish Corvette could be faced with the schooner Iguala and the slops Tampico and Orizaba. The Mexican Federal pilot boats and the Chalco slop, sloop remained in reserve. The Spanish naval squad decided to return to Cuba, but it's necessary to delve into the event. The Mexican historiography, the official historiography, produced from the institutional settings judged the event as a clear victory for the nascent Mexican naval power. However, the event should be taken with more caution. To give a, purpose, a perfect tip, in September 1925, the Minister of Finance, uh, Ignacio Esteva, carried out an inspection of the Mexican fleet in Veracruz and report a precarious state of the fleet. Its crew and its guns. Spanish source, a historical source, such as the files of the Archivo General de Indias in Seville, Spain, uh, I refer to Cuba 204 and Ultramar 100, indicate that the Spaniards' withdrawal was due to the weather conditions, strong winds that made the Spaniards fear the loss of shipping. They decide to return to Cuba without having directly encountered the Mexican Navy. This decision calls to Captain Fernando Dominic the suspension of the employment of commander of the Spanish frigate Santa Casilda by royal order issued in Madrid on January 31, 1966. At the end of the 19th century, the classical Spanish naval historian Cesario Fernández Duro, captain of the Royal, the Royal Navy of Spain, note the following about the seventh. The Mexicans, counting on a squadron recently organized under the direction of Commodore David Porter, former officer of the United States Navy, making it difficult to provide and assist the castle of San Juan de Lua constantly blocked. Sailing from Havana with the frigate Sabina, Casilda, Aretusa, and two transport had no good luck. They suffered an hurricane, dismantled the first and forcing it to return, and dispersed the others. Uh, okay, finally, uh, due to the loss of the Spanish aid, the fortress of San Juan de Lua had to give up on November 17, 1925. Uh, the act of capitulation was sinked, and four days later, November 23, it was evacuated by the Spanish troops. The Spanish flag was lowered, and around noon, the Mexican flag was risen with the fire of 21 cannon shots. Thus ended the occupation by the Spanish crown, a joint action by the nascent Mexican Navy at the resistance of local population of Veracruz. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I want to make sure that we have plenty of time for questions. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to just offer a few comments. Uh, I've written a lot of comments, but I figure I should pare that down so that you guys have a chance to ask questions and get your curiosity settled. Uh, in any case, uh, today what we saw is that Mr. Michael Romero offered us insight and an overview to the naval career of James Barron. He's certainly one of the most controversial officers of the early Navy. Uh, as we know, he's generally known for commanding the Chesapeake during that fateful encounter with the HMS Leopard in June 1807, uh, an event which ultimately lays the groundwork for the War of 1812. Yet, I find it kind of interesting that the author did not mention one important feature of that event, that three of the four men taken from that American ship were African-Americans. Uh, 
Yet they were called American citizens by those who did not understand the situation. Even so, Barron would be court-martialed for that event, and he would again cross the apex of naval historians because of a duel that he fought on March 22, 1822 with Stephen Decatur, one of the officers who presided over that court-martial. Um, what Romero shows us is that Barron was generally engaged with becoming an innovator and an inventor. You know, he describes his work creating a universal system of signals, one of, the most, one of his most significant contributions. He spent some time talking about his invention or his in interest in having a healthy ship uh, and his invention of creating a ventilator. Uh, he wanted to ventilate warships after taking command of the Warren. He devised a bellow to pump out stale air, draw in fresh air below deck. Uh, his patented ventilator from eight, February 1835 was certainly ahead of its time, but never broadly adopted by Congress or the Navy. And in fact, ship ventilation did not change really much at all until steam and electrical power became commonplace aboard ships. Um, he also talks about how Barron proposed a steam-powered prow ship that could be used to blockade uh, to break blockades in shallow water. Again, uh, the plan for that was going to be ultimately not approved by Congress. Uh, after that, he became the Navy senior officer in 1839, and his final contribution to the Navy involved education. Becoming governor of the Philadelphia Navy Yard, he took a keen interest in the Naval School in the asylum's basement. Uh, he basically improved the students who attended there and made better officers for the mid-19th century Navy. Barron embodied the shift in thinking of naval officers in the first half of the 19th century. Many looked to technology in the future, while others simply hung on to their commands. While James Barron served during that era of manifest destiny and was generally overshow overshadowed by that movement, as Romero states, his continuous work to make the Navy better contributed to the development of a sea service that has endured for more than 200 years. His contribution, I think, on Barron is worthy of a certainly a much more detailed study, and I'm very excited that he said that that's something he implan plans to do. Um, for example, this paper uses a litany of books that intersect Barron's career. For example, Charles Cross's Navy of uh, a Navy for Virginia, the Colony's Fleet, the Revolution, Michael Palmer's Stoddard's War, Naval Operation during the Quasi War with France, Eugene Ferguson's Truxton of the Constellation, The Life of Commodore Thomas Truxton, uh, Spencer Tucker's The Jeffersonian Gunboat Navy, and Tucker's and Frank Bruder's book, Injured Honor, The Chesapeake Leopard Affair. Uh, as well as a host of barren papers and unpublished U.S. government documents. Other works that I think could certainly contribute to this project and make it stronger and ultimately should play into his dissertation considerably is also Chris McKee's book, A Gentlemanly and Honorable Profession, uh, The Creation of the U.S. Naval Officer Corps. And, of course, I'm going to throw this one out just for personal preference. Gene Smith's book, uh, The Slaves Gamble, Choosing Sides in the War of 1812, which highlights that, that event uh, of the Chesapeake Leopard Affair and builds the entire book on that particular episode. Oh, all kidding aside, um, this presentation, as he said, is based on his MA thesis, and he's shown you 20,000 words. Uh, so it serves as a welcome addition to our knowledge of another early American naval officer who's in much need of having his career documented. Okay, Samuel Limno, Limnios paper about the development of the Naval Academy's unwritten honor code reveals how the concept emphasizing integrity, honesty, and respect is the result of 176 years of development. By examining the publicly read declam declamatory orders, warning, and reprimanding conduct, superintendents developed a code of honor for themselves and the officer corps. This work fills a hole examining honor culture between the early Republican period and the period of professionalization that emerged 
from the period of Reconstruction to the end of World War I. By looking at this period from 65 to 75, Sam reveals how the, ad, the academy developed during the oversight of three superintendents, David Dixon Porter, John Worden, and Raymond Perry Rogers, and how the academy maintained a high-spirited, unwritten, institutionally resilient honor code emphasizing obedience, loyalty, fairness, integrity, and personal responsibility. Sam also spent some time highlighting the types of punishments that midshipmen faced under each superintendent, including dark and light room diet restrictions. See what, see what some of you guys got to miss out on? <laughs> <laughs> a solitary confinement for a variety of infractions. Social ostracism offered another form of punishment, including at meals and in sleeping quarters, including separating them at roll call formations and parades, and then ultimately confinement to the Santee. Finally, as Sam has revealed, these superintendents wanted to instill an honor code in the midshipmen that would serve them throughout their naval career as well as throughout their lives. His paper is based on his dissertation, which is, I presume, still ongoing. Yes, sir. Yeah, quite. Quite. And I can, I can, I can say it has this paper has very solid research. This commentator cannot suggest another potential work that this author here did not consult. When completed and ultimately published, this work will certainly contribute to our understanding of this August Academy and will add to the historiography of Peter Karsten, William Lehman, Charles Todorich, Benjamin Park, and Mark Hunter. This project will fill a much needed hole. Okay, our last paper today, about the creation of the, Ar the Armada de Mexico, which was <laughs> tied directly to the Mexican army, as both were part of the Ministry of War. And from the beginning, Me Mexico had to, to purchase ship from the United States yeah. to displace Spanish forces from its coast, Mexico also lacked naval personnel, had limited artillery, and had no large shipyard for vessel construction or repair. Arriving in Veracruz on 17 April 1822 from Delaware, the former 12-gun schooner became the Iguala for the first na Mexican naval vessel. The Mexican Navy later acquired a schooner, the Anahuac, the sloop Cam Campichana, Chalco, Chapa, Chapala, Texoco, Orizaba, Tuxapan, Zumbango, Tampico, Papalupacapan, yes. <laughs> another one. I can't even say that one. Tax. Yeah, very well, very well. <laughs> yeah, that one. Yeah, that one. <laughs> nice try. <tribe. laughs> and um, even though Mexican plans, initial plans call for acquiring a frigate and eight corvettes. That's what they ended up with. And it's these vessels that ultimately helped drive the Spanish from Fortress San Juan de Olula by November 1825. I mean, what Eder does here, he walks us through a multi-year campaign against the fortress. He details the campaign to secure Veracruz from Spanish forces. He plans and the plans to isolate and blockade the fortress. And ultimately, it's going to be through a treaty of alliance where Mexico joins with the revolutionary nation of Gran Colombia. And then the uh, arrival of other ships from uh, ship bought from the British government, uh, arms and ammunition acquired from the British, as well as other ships acquired from the Americans that help give the Mexicans the, the edge that they need to gain control. What Eder reveals is a combination of diplomatic alliances in addition to the acquisition of arms, ammunition, and ships from the United States and Great Britain prompted the Spanish Navy to withdraw from Veracruz and the area of the fortress, which ultimately brought about the capitulation of Ula in November of 25. The nascent Mexican Navy and the resistance, as he shows us in this paper, um, the nascent Mexican Navy and the resistance of the local population drove Spain from Veracruz. Now, this paper here reveals a dearth 
of published sources or works of the creation of the Mexican Navy. There's just not a lot out there. It uses uh, a handful of dated published sources. And here I have to go with my Spanish again. Or Juan de Dios Bonilla's Historia Maritania de Mexico, published in 62. Raziel Garcia Arroyo's Biografia de la Marina Mexicana, published in 1960. Yeah. And more recently, Mario Lavelle Argudin, yeah. La Amada de Mexico Independiente, published in 1985. But what I have to say is that this author's educational location in Seville, Spain, allows unparalleled access to the Archive of the Indies, which provides the Spanish side of this formative event. And having worked there in the archives of the Indies, um, my Spanish is not good enough. Your Spanish is much better. You'll be able to. <laughs> you'll be able to uh, but along with Mexican primary sources, Eder has offered us a strong beginning to our understanding of the origins of the Mexican Navy. Now, taken together, what I say is that these three papers offer us a new realm on naval scholarship in the 20th century. Naval historians focused on the age of sail and the personalities of that era for a long time in the history of professionally researched studies. More recently, however, naval history has concentrated on the evolution of, of ships and technology and the campaigns of World War II and beyond. And as a historian of the age of sail, I still find the 18th and 19th century offers us a lot to research. And these three papers all offer contributions to this area of the age of cell and to topics that are in much need of discussion. And hopefully they will continue their research on these topics, hopefully publish them in book form so we can close a few more holes of the 19th century. So thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. So now we'll open up the floor to questions. Questions. Are there any questions here? You make up questions, we can make up answers. Uh, Sam. <laughs> In Spanish, please. <laughs> um, the average age of the midshipmen who were serving at this time here? The average age was between 13 and 16 years old, and that's upon entrance as a plea. Um, when the academy first opened in 1845, as it came from the Naval Asylum, mm -hmm. these were literally boys, sometimes 12, 13 years old. Yeah. Um, and before that, in the age of sail, as Dr. Smith can probably attest to in other research, midshipmen of the early 18th century and the early 19th, late 18th century, early 19th century, we're talking 10, 9, uh, 8. Uh, eight. Yeah. Admiral David Dixon Porter was actually um, the son of Commodore David Porter, who was featured in our, um, in our Spanish colleague's paper, um, who served in the Spanish in the Spanish Navy for a while, and David Dixon, his son, came with him on a Spanish ship at the age of eight and nine years old. So they were literally formed by the sea. Um, but midshipmen, yes, to answer your question, we're between 12 and 14, 16. Sure. Oh, so um, I had a question for Michael and for Sam. So we'll start with Michael. First, I recommend Key's uh, most recent book, Undental Good Nights. Which is about the naval asylum. Yeah, you, you think mm -hmm. that's excellent. Excellent. I've forgotten about that. So yeah. um, I, I would uh, I would commend that to you. And then I was curious about a couple things. One, um, in your research so far on Barron's career for the officers that he served under, um, if he started out in the United States, that would have, I guess John Barry first. But mm -hmm. in looking at any of their papers or in Barron's papers, their opinions of him do you have a sense of how his brother officers viewed him let's let's say before the chesapeake leopard affair in the beginning he seemed fairly well uh, uh, respected uh, at one point uh, john barry this was after the incident where baron re the the frigate during the storm uh, uh, john barry was saying baron is junior to some of these others but he's as fit for command as any in the service uh, Thomas Truxton spoke well of him, thinking Barron should be promoted to uh, uh, captain's rank and assigned to his squadron, where Sam Barron was already a captain. Both of these are excellent ship captains. You put these brothers together, they'll accomplish a great deal for the Navy. 
um, taking those recommendations and others Benjamin started and recommending officers for promotion, he told President John Adams that James Barron is, I'm paraphrasing, but James Barron is represented to me by anyone I've spoken to on the subject as one of the best officers in the service. Um, and I think I mentioned in one of the slides when Barron was coming home from the first Barbary War, this was after uh, Samuel Barron turned command over to Rogers, he'd taken ill. Uh, when he was preparing for the attack on Verna, General William Eaton told Isaac Hull, find my Damascus saber, make sure you give it to James Barron as a measure of my esteem for everything he's done. So before he actually got to that fateful bit of combat in 1807, he was pretty well respected. Once again, he had only routine assignments up to that point, but he did those routine assignments very, very well. And then a follow-up would be, um, you know, the fourth point that you covered about his, his contribution as an innovator was on education. Mm -hmm. And so one, one um, naval officer was profiled in McKee's book, on uh, earlier book on the Naval Officer Corps, trust in as as somebody that formed the core and, mm -hmm. and its its ideal. Um, uh, do you see any kind of parallels between um, Aaron and Truxton in terms of kind of the ideas that they, uh, they voiced um, and, and those, those kinds of principles they thought were important in the formation of an officer? Well, it, it seemed to me that both Truxton and Barron thought that the officer should have a well-rounded education, not necessarily memorize everything out from the books. That's something Barron seemed to uh, agree with uh, William Fontaine Morey about, not get away from the rote memorization, teach the officers the, the principles that underlie everything in those textbooks. Um, and that, that's still one of the biggest mysteries. What got Barron so much interested in education? He was at a grammar school in Hampton, and then he joined the state Navy. He was, he was one of those 13-year-old Virginia Navy midshipmen. But there's no sign as to what sort of educational experience sparked him onto that. But I get the idea he and uh, Thomas Truxton would agree would have agreed on a lot as to uh, how a naval officer should be educated. Thank you. And then the follow-up to Sam is just for the uh, are there in the um, collection special collections for the academy's library? Um, are there is there um, a set for the superintendent's papers? So when you were doing your research. When you were looking at the, the various superintendents, are there are there um, the papers from covering their tenure here at the academy? Are they uh, preserved by the academy, or are they in official navy records? Where were you poking around for for those? So there's an interesting story to them. Um, they originally were in Washington D.C. when the National Archives was founded in 1933. Uh, they were all in D.C. Um, at the National Archives. Um, we became the we, a longtime museum head, uh, Dr. William Jeffries, who the archives here is named after, studied uh, during the night to become an archivist because he was a history professor here in, in Santa Hall. And uh, the, the Naval Academy Archives, per se, was founded in 1969, 1970, really when we started to accumulate everything. So the records were brought back from mm -hmm. D.C. to Annapolis. And once we created environmentally compliant storage to store them here, they were transferred all back over here. And that was done in uh, 1985. So that's when so that's when that was done. We are an affiliate of the National Archives. We're funded by the Navy Department of the Navy, but we are trained archivists. And to answer your question, uh, Record Group 405, Records of the United States Naval Academy, mm -hmm. that comprises records of the superintendent, the commandant, the academic dean, subordinate offices, uh, boards like the Board of Visitors, the academic board. Um, we have video and audio. Uh, photograph collections, 33 millimeter uh, film reels, um, all of the different departments. But that's modern go. stuff. That's all modern stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. They have 19th century. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a, lot, a lot of that stuff's been microfilmed mm -hmm. during the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. Um, and then in 1945, 1911, is all microfilmed. Mm -hmm. National Archives has a copy. We have the physical originals in right. our storage. Um, the order books that I took from my paper, that's a part of the um, published documents of the superintendent's office. That's all maintained here. Um, um, and we're still ongoing trying to gather all the records over the last 30 or 40 years from the 1990s to 2000s. Everything's becoming digital now, so that kind of information. Uh, 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 yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, before Dr. Smith has a question back there, uh, for those of you who are online, if you have a question, please put it in the chat function so that we're able to address your questions and concerns as well. 
Dr. Smith. Yeah, very quickly. My question is for Adair. Um, can you just um, speak a little bit to what the, can you hear me, Principal? It's for Dr. Guy, uh, for Mr. Guy. Yeah. Sorry, can you repeat the question, uh, Higer? I don't. Uh... <laughs> my, my question, my question is, um, can you tell us a little bit about um, the role and uh, and presence of the Mexican Navy on the Pacific Coast? In the Pacific Coast, yeah. The after the so how you say. Uh, after the independence of Mexico, the presence of the Mexican Navy in the Pacific was only about the, the third decade for the 19th century, uh, only with the acquisition of the, uh, the naval uh, and navío de línea, uh, the, the famous uh, Congreso Mexicano. It was a Spanish ship taken by the Mexican government to the, um, to the, to the Peru, the, the last... Uh, the last uh, bastion of resistance of the uh, royals in Callao, in Peru, the, the frigate took over the Spanish route to the Philippines, but in the middle of the route to Philippines, the crew, uh, the Amotino, the, the crew take the, take the power, uh, take over the captain, and decide uh, taken the, for the Mexican territory and the, the Navío de Línea, uh, Mexican Congress uh, ex Asia from the Spanish Navy was the first uh, warship from the Mexican uh, for the Mexican Navy. But this uh, this warship, the ex Asia from the Spanish Army and the first on the Pacific from the Mexican government, uh, Congreso Mexicano, Mexican Congress, is a navy so so giant. The problem with the with the Mexican Navy is not the the boats, is not the ships. The problem is the crew, and the problem is pay the crew to uh, navigate these uh, these boats. So uh, unfortunately, the Congreso Mexicano, the Mexican Congress, the first warship Mexican in the Pacific, uh, it's, it have a, only a one only one travel around the South America, cross from the Magallanes Strait. And uh, from from Brazil, in 1624, uh, came to Veracruz, and in that moment, the how I say, the ship was dismantled because uh, have no Mexican crew to tripulate this warship. This is the first uh, warship in the Pacific, and only two two decades before was a new acquisition from sloops to uh, for, pat for patrol the the pacific territories of mexico the problem with mexico in the pacific is the the contrabando and the pirates uh, to introduce uh, mercants for the french and for the english and uh, for the illegal into illegal for illegal force okay thank you so much uh, we're out of time today we've run over a little bit so thank you all for being here thank you for being inquisitive and thank you to our presenters today thank you, thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Take care. Thank you. Thanks for staying up late. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>